Thank you very much, Mariana. And uh, sorry again for the, the little lag. And uh, so we'll see how it goes. Thank you. So thank you also for the for the kind and for the kind invitation. I really uh, really appreciate it. Okay, so to put uh, things into context, let's go back to uh, to Allendorf about ten years ago. Uh, and this review paper about and the promises of genomics for conservation and uh, and management. Uh, so basically, where we what we were hoping and what has been materialized since then was <clears throat> with uh, uh, with uh, the introduction of genomics. Uh, was to scale up genome coverage for any species in, uh, and in this way, <clears throat> moving towards improving our estimates of population genetic and uh, evolutionary parameters. Then to uh, find, uh, let's say, markers that, uh, that count, for example, adaptive SNP, and also moving towards an integrative approach uh, to elucidate the functional and adaptive significance of molecular variation. And ultimately to get to the say the real stuff for conservation and management, which is about finding causal relationship between genetic variation, phenotypes, and the environment. And uh, we hope to do that to define management units on both, based on both connectivity and adaptive criteria, and uh, to predict future dynamics of selectively important variation and potential for adaptation to new conditions. So despite this uh, promises and the potential power of genomics, <clears throat> Once in a while, there's still those papers popping up questioning the uh, the real uh, use and benefits of applying uh, genomics in management and uh, conservation. So when uh, so uh, when we did this uh, review paper uh, three years uh, three years ago uh, about uh, review about the use of uh, genomics in in fisheries aquaculture and um, in, uh, in fisheries and aquaculture. Uh, so basically, what uh, the, 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 the what came out of that was that uh, while it was, it's it's increasing, it's obviously a broadly acknowledged that geno genomic uh, based method allowed the collection of powerful data, but yet the value uh, of these data to inform fishery uh, management in particular, less so in aquaculture now I would say, but uh, in fisheries definitely uh, remain underestimated at that time. I would say that it's still the case uh, even today. So, uh, so in that uh, review paper, we had uh, collected the um, uh, why genetic, uh, like possible uh, explanation, why genetic data had uh, seldom been incorporated into fisheries management. Uh, so, uh, what came out was that uh, the, the general lack of understanding of the potential value of genetic information from the, the manager. Uh, uh, perception that genetic studies are expensive, perception that genetic results are often oversold, a lack of consistency in interpretations of results by geneticists, and uh, the importance of genetic information uh, often seems to be far outweighed by uh, other uh, inputs, like uh, other types of data. So it seemed that we, we, still, we still have to um, to keep uh, drumming up about the, the importance of genomics for, for, um, for application, especially in the, in the realm of uh, fishery management to really use that type of information for uh, changing uh, management practices uh, in particular. <clears throat> so the outline of the talk is pretty simple. I'll just present uh, recent case studies from our lab that illustrate how genomics uh, uh, was successfully used to address questions of applied rele relevance for fishery management and uh, conservation, and as such, uh, contribute to uh, bridging the gap between uh, basic uh, research and applicable solutions for uh, managers. So my first example is not fish. It will be about the American lobster, and uh, it's the is the joint work of uh, two former PhD students, uh, Jan Doran and uh, Laura uh, Benestin. So in uh, Eastern Canada, the uh, American uh, lobster, in terms of American lobster management, so it's the large represent, the American lobster represent the largest fishery uh, employer uh, throughout Canada with a land, uh, landed value of nearly half a billion Canadian dollars, which represent 30% of all of Canada's fisheries. And it uh, returned an export value of nearly a billion, a billion dollar 
and representing 25% of all of Canada's uh, fisheries at the export value level. Uh, currently, still, the American lobster is managed in uh, Canada is managed in, into uh, 41 uh, lobster uh, fishing uh, fishing areas. <clears throat> so the basic uh, question that uh, led to that uh, to that large scale studies that I will be presented was basically are uh, how uh, do these 41 uh, LFAs correspond to real biological units? And if they are not uh, don't correspond to biological units, how many stocks do we have in uh, Eastern Canada? How are they connected? And are these uh, stocks locally uh, adapted? So, uh, so the work was done as part of a very large research initiative called the Canadian Capture Fisheries Network, more specifically the lobster node of that large scale research program. It was a five year research initiative, but we continued that with further funding at, afterwards. Uh, a co large collaboration that uh, involved the industry, many fishermen association, uh, scientists from the Department of Fisheries and Oceans uh, Canada, as well as researchers from uh, five universities. So we uh, collected uh, female lobster from nearly 100 sampling sites throughout, uh, throughout Eastern Canada and also Northeastern US, uh, covering 32 of the 41 uh, LFA in uh, Canada. And uh, so we genotyped uh, 4,600 uh, lobster uh, using the genotype by sequencing uh, method. We genotype roughly 15,000 uh, high quality SNPs, uh, among which uh, about 1,000 were <coughs> putatively under selection and the others quantified as, uh, as potentially neutral. So the, the main first results of this uh, study was that the analysis revealed a genetic split between two regions that I will call the North region and the South region, but the split was really on the Southern coast of Nova Scotia and right in the middle of one of these uh, lobster fishing uh, area used for, used for management. The uh, mean FST values between samples from North and South is pretty shallow, but that's very typical of just about any, anything that we see in, uh, in marine species with uh, FST value at the, the third uh, digit. So when we look uh, within each of these two regions with the neutral markers, there was uh, no structuring uh, detectable uh, whatsoever. Whereas when we look at the thousand markers potentially under selection, and I will come back into details to that, uh, there was a significant, there were, there were significant uh, genetic differences among samples uh, within uh, region and we will see uh, why and how it worked. So to go into more details into that, we perform a genotype environment uh, association, considering uh, three, uh, three different uh, uh, environmental parameters, uh, salinity, temperature, and primary production expressed by uh, chlorophyll A. And for each of our uh, 96 sampling location, I'm just showing here the analysis done for the Northern region, uh, each uh, sampling site uh, was given a habitat score based on the, uh, the composite value of the three parameters here. And, uh, and that's, that's what is it's illustrated here. So roughly speaking, we see that there's like three major, well, this kind of continuity, but three major regions defined by a sampling site that are in a habitat dominated by high primary production in, uh, in, uh, in the green. Uh, or relatively high temperature compared to the uh, to other sites in, the, in this region here. And then around Newfoundland more in the habitat characterized by a higher salinity and a lower temperature characterized more in, with the blue and the, the blue and the, the pink here. <clears throat> so what, then on the left, that's the illustration of the habitat score for each of the sampling location going from uh, east to uh, west to east, if you want, for example, increasing salinity towards the east, decreasing uh, decreasing primary production uh, towards the east, and here it's the uh, PC uh, PC ordination of uh, the sampling location based on allele frequency of uh, the, the one thousand or so SNPs that are associated with these uh, have, uh, environmental uh, variables. So <clears throat> so now we see that there are uh, genetic differentiation associated with the uh, with uh, with habitat the, each uh, sampling site is uh, 
colored by their habitat score. And roughly speaking, we see uh, that a, a kind of a clustering of sampling site associated with uh, habitat with a high primary production habitat of uh, high salinity and, uh, and, and cold temperature and a habitat characterized by a high temperature relative to uh, elsewhere. So uh, then as part of uh, Jan Donald's PhD, he also uh, took a look at the copy number variants that we could um, that we could analyze based on the uh, on the read coverage uh, of uh, different loci in um, in uh, throughout the throughout the genome, and uh, so basically we um, uh, not only we could see variation in uh, in uh, density coverage for some loci, but uh, the, the 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 variation in coverage was kind of a multi model from which we could interpret uh, roughly the number of uh, copy number categories uh, that there was for uh, different uh, such uh, loci that, um, that appears as a copy number variant in, in the genome. <clears throat> so, we, uh, so we identified uh, at, uh, uh, 40 of, the, of such uh, CNV in the genome, but among these uh, 40 or so, uh, there were 12 that were uh, significantly associated with environmental variation uh, based on uh, that were uh, uh, that were detected both by redundancy analysis and linear regression and these 12 uh, cnv uh, loci were actually associated with the variance in annual temperature uh, in uh, in the, the region so for that study, we did not analyze all the 96 uh, samples. So that was a subset of samples from the, the northern region. And uh, <clears throat> the very striking uh, results, here, if we go back, you'll see that those are the distribution of the sampling sites more or less from uh, the north towards the south. And you see that the, the, the extremes of, uh, that's an example for one of these uh, low sites. And the, at both extreme in the north and the south, uh, the loci were characterized by uh, a low a number of copy, uh, copies, whereas in, more in the middle, a higher number of copies of these CNVs. And that, that was the case for these 12 loci that were associated with variance in temperature. And you see the geographic distribution that is disconnected between these sampling sites where these 12 uh, loci were characterized by a higher uh, uh, number of uh, cop uh, copies of those loci compared to the middle. So, uh, so in brief, uh, and those regions are regions associated with, uh, with the higher variance in annual temperature. So this, this association with, uh, with the number of copy variants at those loci and the, the annual variance of sea surface temperature in those regions. So uh, as it is uh, now our interpretation, this is not, this is not final and I'm, I'm skipping some details here, but uh, basically we would recommend that uh, for the region for which we have enough information by combining information from uh, CNVs and neutral and adaptive uh, variation, that, uh, the, uh, uh, that the more relevant uh, uh, managing uh, areas would be broader. So we would define uh, stands now five different regions, but then there's small embayments uh, that were also genetically distinct from, from larger region, <coughs> larger regions. So the, uh, so the main observation stemming from that study is that we have two main genetic groups that stands out very clearly between the, the North and the South. And we published, published the first insight of that back in 2015, and it's still not considered whatsoever for, uh, for by the, the fishery managers of Department of Fisheries and Oceans. That's a bit of a shame. Uh, so there's only partial correspondence between let's say, real stock structure and management units as they are defined now. And the lobster populations most likely are locally adapted and structure along an environmental gradients, uh, mainly associated with uh, variation in primary production, uh, salinity and temperature. My second example is a uh, work that was uh, led by former postdoc uh, Hugo Carrella, but uh, involving many collaborators, uh, in, uh, uh, including uh, collaborators from uh, uh, 
uh, from uh, Norway and uh, Denmark. And that's the work we have been doing on the, the Capelin in the Northwest Atlantic. So Capelin uh, has a, a very broad uh, circumpolar distribution throughout the Northern uh, Hemisphere. And uh, throughout where it's found, it's, a, it's a really a species of major importance, uh, first as a fishery resource, but also as a keystone species in the food web for other commercial fish or sea mammals, as well as seabirds. So a very important uh, species throughout uh, uh, the oceans in the, north, in the, in the northern uh, hemisphere. <clears throat> Interesting life history variation that we observe in uh, Cape and also is that is these two reproductive strategies, demersal spawning and beach spawning. <clears throat> so uh, that's very typical of, uh, of uh, especially the beach spawning is pretty spectacular when fish come out of the water to actually spawn uh, on, the, on the beach. And these two uh, reproductive strategies are also associated with, uh, with uh, variation in life history traits uh, in, in several life history traits, such as fecundity, oocyte, uh, site, uh, age and sexual maturity, uh, et cetera. <clears throat> so, uh, so we uh, undertook this uh, another large scale project Funded by uh, the uh, by Insert uh, Canada and involving uh, not only uh, uh, research, uh, university partners but also again Department of Fisheries and Ocean, as well as uh, many uh, local fishing organization as well as uh, uh, First Nations from uh, this uh, general area uh, on the Canadian side. So the general specific, the two specific objective of the project was to incorporate population genomic with phenotypic traits to refine stock structure, delineation, and document life history and stock characteristics. Characteristics. I will talk only about only about the population genomic part. And then uh, there was also uh, uh, there was also an objective related to the incorporation of uh, local local knowledge uh, into the into science and stock management strategies that uh, I will not talk about. <clears throat> so, um, so the work on the, on, the Canadian, on the Canadian side involved the analysis of about 1,500 capelins from 35 uh, locations uh, in, uh, involving uh, samples from uh, beach and demersal as well as uh, beach and demersal spawning as well as some offshore uh, samples with a pretty large sample size in each location. Uh, <clears throat> we first, with the collaborators from uh, from uh, Norway and Denmark, gen uh, generated uh, a draft genome to be used for mapping the mar uh, markers and so on. And we work with about twenty five thousand filter SNPs using the genotype by sequencing approach. So the first uh, results is that we uh, we observe uh, three divergent. Uh, and reproductively isolated uh, lineages in the Northwest Atlantic that are named as Northwest Atlantic, the Arctic, and the Greenland uh, lineage. And based on the demographic inference analysis, we estimated that depending on the pairwise comparison, that the divergence between these uh, this uh, group of Capelin uh, probably dates back to uh, at least a couple million years ago. So they can potentially represent reproductively isolated. Uh, cryptic uh, species, as we can uh, we can see from this uh, this uh, structure uh, illustration. So the um, the FST between these three uh, lineages is uh, is is definitely very high for marine species in the order of uh, 0.24 to 0.40. Whereas in comparison, the FST between among samples within uh, these lineages is like two orders of magnitudes lower. Uh, so much more in the range of uh, FST values that we see in the marine uh, species, that is FST values in the range of the third uh, digit. So we also observed the, uh, the uh, polymorphic chromosomal rearrangement that defined these uh, three uh, haplogroups. Uh, it remains uh, uncertain still if this is a case of a chromosomal inversion in the fusion of two chromosomes, chromosome two and nine, or a polymorphic fusion of these of these two chromosomes. Nevertheless, this is a 
definitely a large uh, structural uh, structural variant. And uh, this the uh, the rearrangement frequency uh, of these uh, is different between the, the the beach spawning and the demersal spawning, as uh, shown here. And also we found we found out that the uh, chromosomal these chromosomal rearrangement uh, co-vary with uh, with uh, temperature uh, beside this uh, beach demersal uh, dichotomy. So apparently this uh, large stru structural variance may have something to do with uh, some form of local adaptation. <clears throat> so then more typically doing a genotype environment uh, association, we also found evidence for polygenic, uh, polygenic molecular adaptation to uh, local environmental conditions uh, associated with uh, temperature uh, based on uh, like markers that were identified both by LFMM and RDA either associated with temperature or associated with spawning habitat. Oh, sorry about that. So then as we did for the, um, for the lobster, we, uh, we did an analysis to identify copy number uh, variants. So overall, we identified over 6,000 predictive copy number variants uh, in the, among our samples. Uh, but of these, we found six CNV that were associated with the gonadal somatic index. So they may have something to do, to do with, uh, with uh, sexual maturation or fecundity. And there was also one CNV uh, that was near a gene that regulates the activation of follicle stimulating uh, hormone. So again, uh, CNB that could potentially be involved in, uh, in sexual maturation uh, in Capelin. <clears throat> so then uh, we also found uh, 105 of these uh, CNB that were associated with, uh, with water temperature uh, on, on, the, on the sampling sites. 20% of those were uh, found in the, uh, associated with the sequence of protein coding genes. And uh, quite interestingly, the number of, co of copies decreased with the uh, temperature for all of these uh, 105 CNVs. So quite clearly, they must have something to do with some form of, uh, anyway, some definitely an association uh, with uh, variation in temperature that would perhaps be, uh, be uh, adaptive. And, uh, and the geographic distribution or the variation of these 105 outliers throughout our uh, sampling uh, uh, region, uh, or, or even if we consider the, the overall 6,000, uh, they uh, define this uh, dichotomy uh, between, uh, between like, these two clusters of, of samples, either based on the 6,000 or based on the 105 candidate uh, CNV. Uh, clustering of these, well, these two groups here that were not defined or identified by the uh, by the SNPs. And interestingly, uh, broadly speaking, they are associated also with a dichotomy of uh, temperature. Uh, this uh, this uh, cluster here being uh, more associated. You see the the dots in red. Uh, so it's part of the Gulf of Saint Lawrence. Where the water temperature on average is uh, is warmer than on the on the coast, but uh, interestingly, uh, the sample S8 here, which is in the upper part of the uh, Saint Lawrence River estuary, uh, clustered with the sample from the from the North Atlantic coast, either based on uh, on the on the overall number of uh, CNVs or these candidate CNVs. So it could be that, uh, that the, the genetic differentiation at CNV maybe could be driven by selection acting on these, but dragging the differences of overall in those CNC, but uh, that remains uh, to be uh, further uh, analyzed. <clears throat> so finally, we, uh, we also uh, looked at uh, epigenetic variation in some of those samples, but this time we compared a uh, sample of both beach and demersal spawning uh, locations from, uh, from Canada with beach and uh, demersal spawning location from, uh, from, uh, from Northern uh, Norway. <clears throat> so there's uh, both theoretical and empirical work that are, 
that supports the role of epigenetic mechanism in regulating variation in life history strategies. So here we tested for association between genome-wide uh, methylation and differences between uh, beach and liver salt capelin, both from North America and uh, Europe. And to do this, we first uh, perform uh, low coverage whole genome sequencing at uh, 1.5x on about 450 capelin from uh, 12 spawning sites and uh, whole genome bisulfide sequencing at uh, higher coverage, which is uh, needed. But uh, because of budget constraints on a lower number of fish, but from uh, 11 of the same 12 spawning sites here. <clears throat> So based on the genomic information, over 6 uh, million SNPs that uh, clearly define uh, the two uh, lineages. So the Northeast Atlantic is different from the Northwest Atlantic lineage. So that's a, a fourth uh, lineage of cryptic uh, capelin that adds to the tree that I defined uh, previously. But the main point here is that there was no genetic variation uh, explained by, uh, uh, by, geno uh, by genomic variation between uh, life, uh, life history, that is the, the, bent, the, the, uh, the beach and the Mersal uh, uh, spawning mode. Whereas when we look at the methylation variation, so strong differences here again between lineages, but I want to go more straight to the uh, results on spawning types. So we, uh, so we found that this time there was over 4% four, uh, 4 of the vari variation in methylation that was explained was associated with, uh, with uh, the two different spawning modes. And so we identified uh, over 1,000 uh, differentially methylated regions that comprise over 15,000 uh, CPG islands. So also the very interesting observation from this analysis is that we observe a parallel genome-wide methylation, uh, methylate, methylation changes across both lineages. So you see on the heat map here, uh, the clustering of, uh, of samples of uh, demersal spawning samples from the Northeast Atlantic and the Northwest Atlantic compared to the beach spawning uh, from both continents. And interestingly, 100% uh, of the, those the, the, uh, differentially methylated region were hypermethylated uh, in the diversal uh, spawning capelin compared to the beach spawning. So clearly a non-random uh, pattern of differences in methylation. So the, uh, the overall summary of the capelin study so far is that the capelin in the North Atlantic most likely represent a complex of uh, cryptic species that should consider, be considered for fishery management. Uh, I think we collected evidence for local adaptation uh, despite hygiene flow and weak population structure in the system. Structural variation, either in terms of uh, fusions and or inversions and copy number variants uh, seems to matter for local adaptation in Caitlin. And uh, in fact, C and V uh, revealed population structure that was missed by SNP variation. And finally, we observed pronounced ep uh, epigenetic differences between uh, spawning types, uh, despite the almost absence of genetic differences. So we can question whether uh, epigenetic variation represents a molecular mechanism for perhaps adaptive plastic response to uh, spawning uh, habitats. So I'd like to finish the talk to say a little something about the use of uh, environmental DNA for biomonitoring fish uh, communities. <clears throat> I think it's no secret for anyone that the uh, eDNA-based methods represent now a revolution in our ability to assess and monitor biodiversity. And uh, consequently, it's as a, the, the, we just see a, an, an explosion of uh, ever uh, increasing number, exponentially uh, increasing number of studies using uh, eDNA in the, for various types of applications. So more in the context of fishery management and, uh, and conservation, uh, clearly uh, accurate data on distribution and uh, potentially on abundance are very important for conservation and management of biodiversity. And uh, <clears throat> in the context of aquatic ecosystems, traditionally we have been using conventionally uh, many or different conventional inventory methods that are, have been used or still used, obviously, <clears throat> but not necessarily without constraints. Uh, 
for example, <clears throat> can be associated with unwanted uh, unnecessary mortality. Uh, can uh, the gears can be selective and not returning an accurate uh, accurate uh, perception of a local uh, fish community, for example. And they can be uh, uncertainties in uh, on species identification, for example, when using uh, echo sounding. So clearly, there's room there for the for uh, involving eDNA for improving uh, perhaps uh, practices of fish management and conservation. Yet, as it is the case for uh, uh, for uh, genomics, as I talk about, and as recently uh, pointed out by uh, Palowski and colleagues, uh, eDNA is still timidly implemented as part of the toolbox for routine fish monitoring and or fishery management. And that's, uh, that's largely related to some form of skepticism and concerns that are being expressed that pertains to the lack of congruence between tradition, the perceived lack of congruence between traditional and molecular analysis, as well as uh, biological and technical bias, uh, biases that uh, may affect the generation and processing of eDNA data, and that may in turn impact on their interpretation. So uh, in that context, what I will, I will do here, I will uh, present some recent beyond, uh, say beyond species detection studies to uh, illustrate the potential and the power of eDNA analysis to provide relevant information towards improving fishery management and conservation. So I will address two uh, particular themes. The first one being environmental determinants of community structure. And I will use some study from uh, from our, from our groups, the study that we published, the first one is a study that we published last year. And the study site is the, the upper reach of the, uh, the St. Lawrence River in, uh, in uh, Quebec. St. Lawrence River being the, <coughs> being the, uh, the uh, main outlet draining the Great Lakes uh, drainage uh, basin towards the, towards the Atlantic. <coughs> and more specifically in that area, we have this uh, this interesting uh, hydrodynamic situation whereby you have two very distinct water mass that uh, flow side by side. That one that we call the green water that is actually coming from the outflow of the Great Lakes, uh, which is characterized by <coughs> by um, uh, relatively speaking uh, high pH, low tur uh, turbidity, and uh, high conductivity, compared to what we call the brown water that comes from uh, outlets draining from the Canadian Shield and that comes into the St. Lawrence River. And those water, the, this water mass is more acid, uh, more turbid and uh, with uh, lower conductivity than the green water. <clears throat> so we use the uh, MyFish 12S primers to document spatial variation in fish communities uh, in this area. And that's a very small geographic scale uh, with uh, covering five kilometers uh, in land here but uh, no more than one kilometer across the St. Lawrence River. And we perform redundancy analysis to assess association between community structure and environmental factors, mainly, well, the, the two water mass, but also uh, water depth, uh, turbidity, and, uh, and uh, geographic distance. But I'm not gonna talk about geographic distance uh, here. So uh, first, and then we have compared the, uh, the, the fish detection with the uh, eDNA metabarcoding with uh, what has been reported in the past based on traditional sampling using gillnet and seeing. And uh, basically with much less effort, if you see the number of station analyzed, uh, we detected more species and actually uh, we were probably uh, exhaustive in detecting all species present in the system with much less effort compared to the capture, uh, capture sampling. For example, uh, combining gillnet and seeing in over 200 uh, samples, we still did not reach the number of species detected with uh, eDNA. But more interestingly, uh, even at that small geographic scale, uh, distinct fish communities were associated with distinct water masses. That's what we see here. So we have the sampling sites as, uh, found in the brown waters, that uh, brown water, and the sampling site found in the green water, uh, re revealed by this uh, redundancy analysis. <clears throat> but also within each of the of the two water mass, the brown and the green water, 
we saw the same community differentiation, so a parallel differentiation associated with turbidity in uh, both water mass. For example, in, uh, in uh, where the water is less turbid in the brown water, uh, we are seeing the same species that we were seeing in uh, the lower turbidity in the green water, or uh, conversely, the same species being seen in the high turbidity uh, part of the brown waters uh, or the high turbidity part of the green water. And the same thing was seen associated with, uh, with water depth. Uh, so the same species being associated with, uh, with uh, lower depth in both in brown water and green water and some species associated with the deeper waters in both water mass uh, masses as well. So then if we change the geographic scale, so the study I just presented is located here. So now we have a broader view of the whole St. Lawrence River draining toward the, uh, towards the Atlantic. So this system uh, represents uh, a very strong environmental gradient across 1,300 uh, kilometers of diverse habitat going from uh, the total fluvial section followed by the fluvial estuary uh, which is an area of, um, of uh, fresh water, but with very high, uh, very, uh, very high tides up to five meters, followed by the middle estuary, which is relatively brackish and moving into uh, more uh, salty uh, water, waters. So here we use again the MyFish 12S primers to assess the effect of spatial and environmental factors on the variation of uh, fish community structure uh, along uh, the system. <clears throat> so, um, so uh, we saw uh, a strong shift of species composition illustrated by this uh, first figure here. So uh, samples are organized uh, from uh, the western part to the eastern part, fluvial sectors, middle estuary, marine estuary, and the Gulf of St. Lawrence. So we see that the freshwater uh, species are um, obviously strongly associated with the fluvial sectors but some of them sometimes entering the brackish uh, waters of the middle uh, estuary. And uh, the, uh, the shade of the blue is, uh, is associated with the relative abundance of, of each of the different species uh, detected. Then for the anadromous species and the eel, the catadromous species, uh, they were observed in the fluvial sectors but uh, they were definitely the, the, the dominating species in the middle uh, estuary and essentially not found at all in the more uh, marine waters. Whereas finally the marine species were where they were supposed to be, that is in the, associated with the marine, uh, the, 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 the more saline waters, but some of these species make incursion in the more, uh, brackish, uh, more brackish waters between the fluvial sectors and the marine estuary. <clears throat> so then just uh, looking at the or sample ordination projection on the, on the, the PCA here, uh, we see that samples, generally speaking, are associated with uh, environment, the environmentally distinct uh, sectors. But a better way to look at that is, uh, <clears throat> is uh, this analysis that was, um, that was done considering the, uh, the samples clustering in association with the uh, variation in the, the thermal, uh, the uh, environmental parameters such as tide, temperature, salinity, as well as the length of the growing season. So we see that there's a fish community split that are that is determined by these predictor environmental uh, variables. For example, we have these three samples uh, that cluster together based on the fish composition, but also cluster together based on the uh, characteristic of temperature and salinity uh, and so on. So then a little something uh, about the, uh, the use of eDNA to get information about the relative abundance, either based on single species analysis by quantitative PCR or uh, from uh, e-metabarcoding data. So first uh, analysis based on a single uh, species analysis. <clears throat> so we were, I think, probably among the, the first back in 2016 in a fishery management context to show that we could, uh, we could uh, find an association between the abundance or the concentration of eDNA in different lakes 
in association with uh, with the catch per unit effort with the conventional gears, uh, namely uh, gill nets. Subsequently, there have been a series of studies like this one on, on brook trout, or more recently on walleye, not from our group, uh, that also showed uh, the strong association between eDNA concentration and either walleye density or walleye biomass, with uh, <clears throat> depending on how you look at things, with an R square up to a uh, to 0.81, which is obviously very very strong, and that shows that you can definitely get some at least semi quantitative information of abundance at the single uh, species level. And the authors of that study made some uh, suggestion of how to use that information in the fishery management uh, context, but I'm, I'm not going to go into that. <clears throat> and uh, very, very recently, uh, Matt Yates uh, and colleagues showed that you could further improve the uh, correlation between the, uh, the EDNA abundance and, uh, and, uh, and the actual fish biomass detected by uh, capture methods. If you integrate a nanometric scaling coefficient into models of eDNA concentration and uh, organism uh, abundance, and that's being illustrated here, but uh, you see that uh, the increase of the correlation value between eDNA and uh, capture method, if you consider the nanometric uh, scaling coefficient to uh, to adjust the um, to make some adjustment to consider differences in uh, body size in different, uh, in different lakes, mean body size in different lakes. And uh, finally, for single species of abundance, just a quick uh, note on this uh, great study from uh, Kuai and other uh, Japanese colleagues that was published last year. And they showed from uh, analysis of DNA in sediments that you could detect a long-term uh, variation in DNA abundance uh, in this case here for the Japanese uh, anchovy. So you see variation uh, of abundance at different uh, time period going back to the, uh, to, the, uh, uh, to the 18th and even 17th century. And they showed also where they had data or long-term data on landing that there was a correlation between DNA concentration in the sediments and the uh, landing value uh, that were available in, in some of these locations uh, in Japan. So you can potentially go back in time and document variation in, in abundance, at least in some circumstances. Then something about, uh, something about uh, the possibility to, to get some abundance information, but this time based on, uh, on e-metabar coding. So that's a study that we've done in our, uh, in our group. Uh, where we compare experimental gillnets data with the e metabar coding, again, using the MyFish uh, primers. So in this time we were in uh, Northern Quebec uh, on a study area uh, spanning about 200 kilometers with uh, 17 sampling sites. <clears throat> so we compare capture with the gillnets and the uh, species detection based on eDNA. And uh, just very quickly, we detected uh, twice as many species based on eDNA that were detected compared to what was detected with gillnet. <clears throat> but the main point here is that there was definitely one dominant species in the system as detected by the gillnets, which is again, the, uh, the walleye. And for that most abundant species in the system, we compare the number of reads uh, detected among the, uh, at the various sampling locations based on metabar coding with, uh, with qPCR. And we saw that there was a fairly good correlation between the number of sequence reads detected by metabolic coding and the amount of DNA detected by a quantitative uh, PCR. But uh, even uh, more interestingly, <clears throat> we observe also seeing a relatively decent correlation between uh, uh, either abundance or biomass, but more, uh, better correlation for uh, abundance. So the number of fish uh, detected by, uh, collected by gillnet and qPCR, but the level of correlation with the metabar coding was just about the same than with qPCR. So in other words, uh, for in the case of this most abundant species, we could uh, get uh, an, an association between eDNA and uh, abundance detected by uh, by sampling years that was as good for metabolic coding as uh, for qPCR. 
And uh, finally, my uh, last uh, example, uh, work this time that we have done in the Gulf of St. Lawrence, so we're moving to marine waters, and uh, where we wanted to compare the efficiency of uh, EDNA with, uh, with the trawling surveys done by the Department of Fisheries and Oceans Canada to document the immersal fish communities at 85 sampling stations in the system. So uh, very quickly, in total, we detected 94 species, uh, <clears throat> of which 71 were detected by eDNA, 64 by uh, trawling, and only, uh, but only 43% uh, of those species were shared between uh, both uh, methods, so 47 species. But for the most abundant species, they were the same uh, being detected by both methods. The most uh, abundant one clearly being the redfish, uh, Sebastis, with uh, proportion either in biomass in the trawl or the number of reeds in eDNA uh, being fairly comparable. Whereas the other three most abundant species, the, uh, the Greenland halibut, the herring, and the, uh, and the capelin, they were the same, but in variable proportion between trawl and eDNA. But yet, the four most abundant uh, species in the system uh, were detect, uh, detected were the same both in trawl and eDNA. And then for the 47 species that were detected by both methods, uh, we had a fairly good correlation between uh, among these uh, 85 sampling sites that we had. So the number of sampling sites where a given species was uh, detected by uh, in the trawl or uh, the, the number of sampling sites that the same species was detected by eDNA. Uh, so for example, species number 30 uh, was detected at 40 sampling sites by eDNA and was detected at say uh, 23 or 24 sampling sites uh, by trawl. But overall, there was a fairly good uh, association between, between both. But finally, for the most abundant species, again, for the, uh, for the redfish, uh, so we had a significant correlation uh, between the, the, abund the abundance of DNA uh, expressed in terms of the number of sequence reads and the biomass detected at, uh, by the trawl at each of these uh, spawning locations. So, <clears throat> so uh, I think we can say that eDNA for obtaining uh, information on single species abundance, uh, it works. Of course, there's work to be done, but it works. And obtaining for, which is more debated than contentious, uh, obtaining fish abundance information for, from e-metabar coding seems to be doable in some circumstances, but uh, yes, there's, there's work and improvement to be done, but there's definitely hope there as well. So uh, finally, final conclusion or final take home message if you, if you want. Uh, I think, well, based on, on these examples, but so many others that are popping up in the literature more and more, the value of genomic information, including the value of eDNA uh, for fishery management and conservation, uh, I think does not need to be further demonstrated. And there's definitely much to be ga uh, gained by integrating genomic informed methods into management practices. And I guess the very final take home message is just do it. So with this, I thank you very much for your patience and time. And again, I'm sorry for the little delay I had. And Thank you very much. Thank you for this really lovely talk. I, I can say that I really agree with your final messages to it. I think it's the same in forestry. Um, and I will open now the floor for questions. And how you can do that is by either raising hand uh, in the, with the reactions button, or you can also ask your question in a chat and we will read it. Um, so please, are there any questions uh, for um, Professor Bernache? I hope I pronounced it right now. Yes, sure. Sure, okay, great. Uh, and while you are thinking for your questions, I, I have a, a question directly for you. You said that, um, that um, when you looked at the different structures, you should rearrange the management units. Uh, for fisheries, do you know if if this has been taken up by fishery managers or 
or are you are are you struggling for them to integrate that in their management? No, I'm not. Well, I guess I'm I'm no no longer struggling. I just uh, we just we just, we just produce that. No, it's not it's it's not considered whatsoever. And uh, so <laughs> so I hope it's a, the same situation elsewhere. And it's not it's not only Canada that is behaving that way, but. Uh, I mean, this is like the like the lobster project, for example. I mean, the striking thing is that this it was a partnership research program. So we uh, oriented the question based on uh, to the requests of uh, of Fisheries and Oceans Canada, and in association with the uh, with the Fishermen Association. So we generated information. It's there. It's published, and and they don't use it. Okay. So, it's, so it's, there's definitely a, a roadblock when you go from the, let's say, from the science, even let's say within, the, let's say in Canada, within Fisheries and Oceans Canada. So things go fine up to the, you know, the, to the science level. But then when you, you try to move the science to the management level, there's huge inertia there. And, uh, and uh, yeah. Yeah, and I don't think that's because the the information is not is not relevant. I think it has to be relevant uh, because the, the pattern is in some cases is so striking that you have these you know very distinct units that really correspond to to what Oops. should be the real biological units. Uh, somebody is sharing screen. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I'm I'm sorry for this. I, I, I can I can very well relate to to you. I mean, there is a lot of information in forestry also about how to manage and how to include genetics into management. And I think that that we are struggling also. I mean, maybe it's a little bit easier because we have uh, European initiatives. Um, but but I will I will maybe let somebody else to comment on that from personal experience. Uh, but first, uh, uh, I would like to ask uh, Fabio, you raised your hand, please. Yeah. Maybe an easier question. Oh, yes, it's actually uh, a rather na naive question related to the eDNA, because I really am curious about that part. And I was wondering, because I guess that with the eDNA, basically you have uh, primers that are specific for fishes and for several kinds of fishes, okay? And uh, what do you think would happen if you try to do shotgun sequencing on water samples? Would you get some information? Because with some kinds of soil, for example, with a whole genome shotgun, you can catch at the same time animals and uh, plants, small animals. And I was wondering if this could work on water or maybe you don't get anything. Yeah, I think that would be, I think that would be very difficult to uh, interpret what you get. You would, you would get something, but you know, with shotgun sequencing, uh, you know, what you need is a reference database one way or the other to at least associate even, you know, either at the family level, if you don't, you cannot go to the species level, but uh, with shotgun sequencing that does not target specific ge genomic region, uh, you're going to get lots of complex information, and I think you would have a hard time. So what what people do instead, like uh, you know, this this people uh, work, it's, the the field is evolving so so quickly and so interestingly. So this there are people that are working on to you know defining or uh, characterizing uh, trophic network, and so what they, what they will do they'll they will use say um, uh, universal primers for metazoans, universal primers for prokaryotes, universal primers for, for, for plants or let's say phytoplankton. And, and from that, so at least you'll, you know, you'll get at least some more precise information in each taxonomic group. And, mm -hmm. and from that, then you, you get, you can get a whole image of the, uh, more than the well, the, the overall community at the at different taxonomic level. But you think that the DNA quantity and quality would be reasonable, or no? Well, quality, yes. I guess when it, you get into that level of complexity, uh, I would not bet much on. Uh, I think on the 
on the quantity. I think why why you know it's I think why it, it may work or it seems to work in some circumstances with metabar coding in fish is that these while these primers are very efficient that go going to the to the species species level uh, the um, then we have a very good re reference database uh, also and um, and then and then it seems to you can get some um, quantitative information on the most abundant species. What I didn't show is that when you, when you go down and you go like the less least abundant species, I think there's too much variance, and then you don't get that such a strong association. But then, like I showed on the like I showed on the you know like the community approach, comparing community structure even at small geographic scale, even if you're not totally accurate in in terms of abundance, you still have signals of different community structure that will be based on some level of quantitative information. Because if it was only species detection, they would all merge these, these uh, different fish community that we define. They are largely defined by the number of reads that we see for different species, even if the species are co common to different communities. Thank you very much. Thank you. I think there's Thank Sasha. you. And another question from Sasha, please. Yeah, hi. Uh, thank you for the really interesting talk, Louis. Um, my question also goes into the uh, eDNA fish community direction. And I was wondering how uh, representative the trawls really are. Is there any data or any knowledge about uh, if the trawls are kind of an exact uh, estimate of the fish community? Because I expect some bias to be around uh, with the trawls as well. Yeah, yeah. well, that's a, that's a very good question. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> and the reason why I'm I, I answering this is that I mean that's that's a recurrent thing that that pops up, you know, when pe from let's say from the side of skepticism on ED, on EDNE information uh, is is kind of taken for granted that what you see with conventional uh, fishing gears is the truth, and then if you don't see correlation with ED, a strong correlation with EDNE. That's the fault. The fault comes on eDNA. So I keep saying, well, you've got to split the variance into two. Part of the variance must come to uncertainty with the gear, and part of the uncertainty must come from eDNA. But to be fair, you have to consider that you don't know exactly what the truth is when you use a sampling gear. Yeah. So, yeah, so I, yeah. think that, I, I think the, the, the troll is, is biased for sure. Yeah, and so probably with the low abundance, you have the same problem with the troll that you have with the eDNA. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. But, thanks. But because because the use has been there for 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 longer, it seems that people still think that you know you've got the real truth with the sampling years, and then eDNA doesn't work. Yeah, but the ocean is large. <laughs> <laughs> thanks. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. And I have a question in the chat from Bruno. And he is asking, how do you see eDNA used in forest trees? Oh, I guess that depends on your question. But I mean, there's there's definitely work being done on uh, ter terrestrial uh, ecosystem, uh, either on either on plants or or animals. Um, so I guess it depends what kind of question you would you would need to address. In the sense that uh, I don't know, like I mean, you can unlike fish, you can see your trees, so you can I mean, you can count them and, and identify them. So, what kind of question would need to be addressed that you don't actually see what you're looking for, and then where where eDNA traces would be useful? Bruno, do you do you maybe want to uh, maybe want to elaborate a little bit on what kind of use? Or actually, what kind of question? Hi. Uh, hi. Actually, no. I. <clears throat> it's true. That the, the trees you see them, you count them. I guess with uh, with uh, um, symbiotic fungi, that could be interesting because you don't see them. Uh, but <clears throat> yeah. to build on on your statements in the beginning about the use of genomics for uh, conservation, um, I don't know about eDNA. I, I see the point for, for genomics for sure, but eDNA, I'm not sure with trees, yeah. how we can improve conservation. Yeah. And, and also, uh, 
I'm a little bit disappointed that the fish community doesn't do better than the forestry community. You know, it's I thought you guys were better organized and, and the flow of information from science to practice was better, but it seems that we have the same problems. Yeah, well, there, there are some exceptions. I mean, like uh, in in the in in the in fishery management. I mean, the let's say the the, the classical case where even before genomics, that genetics has been considered and and, and used since the se the seventies is the management of Pacific salmon on the west coast of uh, either Canada or North America for some reason, uh, maybe because uh, earlier researchers like uh, like Fred Allendorf and uh, and and uh, others really pushed the uh, push the field or, or maybe because um, of the importance of Pacific salmon from at, at all levels on the West Coast, but definitely the, it has been, has been used forever, like from allozymes and, and really into, into management. Uh, I think there's some, uh, some uh, hopeful stories in, uh, in Europe also in the Mediterranean, uh, but generally speaking, we still have to struggle. Yeah, that's uh, yeah. We also have to still struggle with the trees, and 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 I I'm also a little bit surprised because we often in forestry we take we we read I mean at least I do I read papers from fisheries and 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 we look at the I mean the life history traits are somewhere I mean th there are similarities and and that's why uh, I was yeah. also hoping that maybe you guys have it have it all figured out. So, yeah. 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 So. so coming back to uh, to the forest, I mean, if it some, I don't know if it if it can potentially be of, of interest or or not. I don't know about let's see, uh, I don't know pollen dispersal or something like that. Where because people analyze uh, eDNA from from air, and uh, I mean you could perhaps like see see what's what's floating in the air, and it's in well, you're the one that can think about questions in the related to forestry, if that would be relevant or not, but that's definitely, you know, where something you, you don't easily see, and then you can just filter air and analyze what DNA is in there. People are, people are doing that now. No, that, that's great. And, and I have another question from Katarina for you. Katarina, please. Yes, hello. Thanks a lot for the great talk. And uh, just one comment, I know that uh, in our lab, uh, there are people using eDNA, for example, to extract pollen from honey samples. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I think there's uh, many options that we might not be aware of. Um, but I have a question about the um, copy number variants. I, I found it intriguing that you found this strong association uh, with the temperature for the copy number variants, but not for SNPs. And I was wondering what, do we need to actually be really able to detect them? So do we really need very good reference genomes or what kind of sequencing method do you use? Well, like for the, um, for the, for the lobster, like there's a genome now for the, for the, uh, the American uh, lobster, which, which we didn't have when we published that study and it just came, the, 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 the genome was, uh, was uh, made available just uh, this uh, recently, uh, so uh, so we didn't have much in terms of genomic resources, and uh, so the type of data that we had was uh, was um, was just reads from uh, genotype by sequencing. So uh, you know, eighty base pairs, short sequences, uh, without knowing where they are in the genome because we didn't have a genome. So, but uh, <clears throat> what we have were so you know we could we could stack the reads based on on, on homology with other reads and see that there was a high variance in, in coverage uh, for some of these uh, of these loci, and uh, and then realizing also that uh, that variance in coverage was multimodal, multimodal. So it was not it was not random, but basically the was done without much genomic resources. So of course, if you have a genome, it's gonna be much easier and much precise and, uh, and so on. But it all starts with uh, detecting uh, statistically significant variation in, uh, in coverage. And you have to rule out other reasons that could explain variation in coverage. And once you're pretty sure that what you're looking is real variation in coverage, it's not a technical artifact, then you can make some interpretation that those are copy number variants and make these 
uh, association with environmental variation, for example. Thanks a lot. Thank you. And Benjamin has a question for you as well. Please, Benjamin. Thank you. Thank you very much for the talk. Um, <clears throat> I have a question about the lobster project and the way you use the, um, the copy number variation that might be under selection. It's very interesting how, how you did it. I wonder, in a, let's say in a system where you have a population genetic structure, so not in the way you are doing it because you have a shallow population differentiation, but in trees we have a high differentiation I wonder whether the copy number variation information could reflect uh, population structure fairly, the same as it is with SNPs, and whether we could use similar GA methods uh, with CNV as we do it with SNPs. Because that's sometimes I, I saw in other systems, uh, correlation between population structure is not always the case. So could you, could you comment on that? Is that the rule that correlation with population structure with the... Yeah. SNPs, the allelic SNPs and uh, copy number variation regions. Yeah. The information we can gather from that because we we sort of need to account for population structure in GEA. Yeah. So. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll tell you what I think about, uh, about the correcting for population structure. And I get into debates about that all the time. I find that counterintuitive because if, uh, it, so it depends on, I think it's context dependent and, uh, and when you think about it, if, if natural selection is the main determinant of your population structure, and then you want to look for adaptive variation, but you correct for population structure, you're just going to get rid of the actual signal you're looking for. And it makes sense that in, I mean, if it makes sense that uh, it, it, it makes sense in many systems that it's, it's, actual, it's actually uh, natural selection that's going to shape your population structure because of let's say adaptation to different and uh, to different environments and so on and and it so this so the signal you you're gonna get can be pretty overlapping between what's under selection and and what's neutral so so for me uh correcting systematically for population structure uh when you do a you know genotype environment associations type of studies, uh, I, would, I would first think about, you know, the context of your, of your system. So, uh, so then um, I guess, depending on the system, you can have association or not with the population structure seen by SNPs or CNVs. I guess it's, it's hard to, to predict. Like um, for, some, for some reason, it could be, a, it could be also a matter of sensitivity. Um, uh, because you know, copy number variants are more, more uh, the, the the signal may be stronger and uh, easier to detect from a statistical standpoint. That may be the reason, for example, why when I was talking about the Capeland, that we saw that there was this pretty strong differences between samples from the Gulf of Saint Lawrence and the and the Atlantic uh, coast or Atlantic Ocean, and that was not that dichotomy was not detected by SNP whatsoever. But I think it could have been just a matter of sensitivity um, uh, of uh, the, the potential of detecting signal because the signal was stronger with CNV or something like that. Thank Angela, you. Angela, do you have a question for me? Nice to see you. Actually, I do. <laughs> hey, Louis, thank you very much for, for the talk. Really fascinating. Oh, oh, oh. If you don't know Angela, she's a, a great population gen gen genomicist. She could have given this talk better than me. <laughs> no, thank you, thank you. Um, no, actually, I'm very fascinated with the, uh, well, of course, with all the studies you have shared, but um, I'm very uh, curious about the Cape Plain study because, you know, you showed this clear differentiation based uh, mostly on the epigenetic marks, but not much on the, on the SNPs themselves. So this is a, just out of curiosity, is there any evidence that Cape Plain might like shift? Like are there might some fish that perhaps might um, spawn, a, a, you know, in the coast and others demersal or they can switch in the, in the spawning behavior? Uh, that's a, <clears throat> during their uh, lifetime. That's one question. 
And then the other question is, is like if there is any hypothesis on what kind of environmental cue might be driving these differences in the epigenetic marks? Well, we think it could be, uh, I mean, that's, it's like totally hypothetical, but we think it's, it's diff difference in the in temperature that, that, you know, that could be the, that could be the main thing, but, uh, and that could be potentially determined at the, uh, at the embryonic le level when, uh, when the, the, lar uh, the, the larvae develop on, on the beach, as opposed to the, to the, to the deep waters. And that's where you could get this, uh, you know, this, this, uh, differences uh, in epigenetic marks uh, developing at the, uh, at the early life history stage. So, uh, so that's part of the, the answer. The other, the other one, I don't remember which is which, um, just like that, but either the demersal, uh, the demersal uh, fish that spawn the demersal or fish that spawn beach, one of them, uh, one of these mode is semiparous. So they're not they 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 want so they want semiparous means the spawn you reproduce only once and die, so they would not be able to they would not switch to an alternative mode and the next year because they, it's semi semiparous, but uh, but one of these two forms could but I mean the potential would be there, uh, but I don't think it's known because there's no there's no real way to nobody has uh, has been able to let's say to tag Caplan and and. Uh, and see them in the demersal, demersal uh, spawning area one year and see them on the beach next year. I don't think that's kind of study is just logistically impossible to do. Mm, okay, thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. Are there any more questions for, for Luis? Yes, Christian, please. I can ask the question out, out of curiosity. So in for terrestrial, you do have environmental associations in several species, as you showed. And for terrestrial species, we have pretty good environmental descriptors, at least in some uh, senses. We have very, very high accurate uh, topographical data. We have good climate data. Soil is probably different there. We are missing the data for for uh, trees or at least accurate ones. So I was wondering, if, out of curiosity, how is this situation in marine science. Do you have good environmental data? Can you trust them? Do you also have predictions like for the future? Uh, for example, do you prediction how sal salinity and temperature will develop in the yeah. future? Yeah, yeah. No, I, 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 that would, I would say that the, like, the database available are, are very good in, in general, like those that we have used either for, for lobster of, um, or K, uh, Capelin. Um, I cannot remember the names of the databases uh, precisely, but uh, but uh, generally speaking, like oceanographers and, and in particular would would agree that the that those uh, reference database for environmental information they are they are very good, and uh, and uh, yes, like uh, in terms of uh, making prediction in for the future in terms of temperature and salinity. Uh, definitely, for sure. There's a there's an excellent Canadian scientist, among others, that uh, published a couple of really cool work on Arctic char, making exactly that, uh, making prediction about change in temperature and sea fish would adapt to those conditions. His name is Jan Bradbury, and um, and that's exactly what they they've done. You know, in this uh, genomic vulnerability context, making prediction if if a different population would could could adapt to the to the new environmental condition, but of course you need to consider that uh, fish can migrate as well because it's a you know it's open space. But uh, yeah, I think we have good the reference uh, environmental database to do that kind of work. I agree. Of course, for us it's also easier to describe the environment. We are very, they are very very uh, sessile, so that's easy. <laughs> No, I, I am happy to hear that. I'm just surprised that we then still see papers and we just had one this week in our journal club that use actually land surface climate data to, do, to describe the environment of fish, marine fish and to do predictions. Yep. Thank you. Thank you, Kiesel. Okay. Um, are there any more questions? Any more curious questions out of curiosity, like Christians? And uh, I will give you another 10, 15 seconds. And I will keep talking because I'm terrible at 
at uh, listening to quiet. Has it been 10 seconds, 15 seconds? No, yes. Okay, <laughs> I guess there are not many more questions, not questions. And that's why I would really like to thank you, Professor Bernache, for the lovely talk and for this great insight into the, the fisheries and the management and the sad news that you don't have it all together like we thought. Um, so thank you, Anna, and an applause for you and your talk. So I will do it. Just thank you very much. Time. Thank you, and thank you, thank you again for the invitation. And yeah, eventually, in the near future, hopefully, we'll be able to meet. Yeah, hopefully yeah. that would be that would be great. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I, and I'm sure that if anybody in our audience would have further questions, they can contact you on your mail, uh, and you will. Oh, probably... absolutely. Absolutely, please. Yeah. please. Okay, yeah. great. And great thank you so because, much again. Uh, really yeah, great. because we still keep learning from uh, from fisheries and and. Um, well, there's, I, I think there's, uh, yeah, there's I mean uh, there's there's a lot of uh, uh, analogy to be made between the the, the world of uh, forestry and uh, and especially marine fish, uh, fisheries because it's we you know we're. In, in, in both cases, we're thinking about very large, generally, generally speaking, very large effective population size, uh, strong potential for dispersal among population. I would think that very often you have weekly population structuring in trees as well, I guess in many yeah. species at least, and uh, same sorts of questions. So actually, the, I'll finish with that. The institute where I work, I'm the director of that institute. And uh, so we're a, a, a collection of, uh, of researchers either from uh, natural sciences like bi biology and biochemistry and forestry and agriculture and we we, we share common uh, like common common type of question and with especially uh, very close in terms of question and the way to address them with people working on forestry people that you may know if you know the name of Jean Bousquet that rings a bell yeah that know. rings a bell Nathalie, Nathalie Isabel. So Nathalie yeah. is an yeah, associate member of the institute as well, and uh, yeah, we share we share common interests for sure. Okay, yeah. yeah, that's that's great to hear that uh, yeah. uh, that there is a potentials for collaboration or answering questions and, and going forward. And, yep. and with that, I would like to thank you. But I would also, since this is the last talk of the third series of the Able Tree webinars. I would also like to thank all the speakers who contributed to this series and to all of you as the audience for your attention and for your great, great questions and for the discussions. So thank you all. Uh, thank you. And I hope we see, we see each other sometime soon uh, in the future and keep tuned for the Evil Tree webpage for further information. Thank you all. Thank you. Hi, Octavio, <laughs> and hi, everyone. <laughs> I like this. I see some faces that I know, a few of them, like Octavio. Yeah. <laughs> we can keep a link uh, open a little bit longer, so if anybody wants to ask something or just say hi to somebody, that is also possible. Right, Christian? Yes. Yeah. At okay. some point, I have to go home, but then... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I have a PTA meeting. In, in, in yeah, I know. So, but... <laughs> Okay, thanks everybody for okay. attending. Thank you. Bye, Bye everyone. Bye-bye.